I just finished reading Marine Ford and there's some stuff that I want to talk about. At the start of Marine Ford, nobody has shown up yet. There's tension in the air and I was actually pretty nervous thinking that Luffy would be the first person to arrive at Marine Ford considering that Whitebeard was nowhere in sight. That's great. Narratively, it's building tension and we can see that reflected in all parts of the world. Some people are panicking, thinking that it's the end of the world. There are adults who hoped that he won't show up. Even some kids are making like morbid songs about Whitebeard. And it really helps us get a broader perspective into what the rest of the world is thinking. Because while we knew that there was a war that was going to come up, I didn't actually know how the rest of the world was going to feel about the war or how big it would have been perceived. And here though, we see it for what it is. It's a world changing event being brought broadcasted all over the world. It's a fight between the world government, this like symbol of peace for a lot of people with a ton of people fighting, worried about what's to come. Like even the admirals are realizing that picking a fight was at the very least a huge inconvenience. And that's because they're up against Whitebeard, who's like one of the strongest pirates from a previous era, who very poetically, by the way, with the earthquake fruit, is one of the strongest people who has literally made the world tremble. Marineford itself is a fantastic set piece for this fight. Not only because it presents us with a lot of strategy that we get to see on the stage, but because of the layout of this stage. And so that brings up a ton of interesting questions like, what's Whitebeard gonna do? Is he gonna try to break through the sides first and slowly make his way to... No! The Moby Dick comes out of the center. It's a beautiful ship, by the way. I love the face that, like, the Moby Dick has. But seriously, what a power move from Whitebeard. Just squaring up against the world government, planting himself right in the center of everything. And along with him are a ton of other pirates from the New World. I'm hoping that eventually there's going to be some good tie-ins with at least some of these characters, especially as the Straw Hats enter to the New World and now have a connection with Whitebeard. As a side note, there's a lot of stuff that I want to talk about in this arc, so let's just get character abilities out of the way. First up we got Marco, which is a mythical Zoan type. It's a phoenix? I love that with Devil Fruits, imagination's the limit. Like beforehand, we have seen extinct animals as Devil Fruits, but now we're also just seeing like conceptual creature Devil Fruits. So it's just not that far off to imagine like a unicorn or a dragon Devil Fruit. If you really want to lean into like the edges of the mythical animal route, you can have like a Bigfoot or a vampire Devil Fruit if those count. Further along in the arc, we also get Kobe, who we see have that same uh, mantra like feeling the life force slash emotions that we saw uh, that girl have back in Skypea. So it's interesting to see that along the path from being like scared Kobe to less scared Kobe, he developed this ability, kind of like how Luffy didn't start off with, but over time also developed Conqueror's Hockey. Finally, we get Magma Boy, who I keep forgetting his name. It's Magma Boy whose Devil Fruit has the ability to create just absolute destruction with that Magma Fruit. Which reminds me of an equally destructive fruit, Whitebeard's Tremor Fruit, which I think is just way cooler. The way we see him not only take a stand, but also just shatter the air, is an amazing way to showcase the raw strength that Whitebeard has. Anytime he is using this, it feels like he's quite literally shattering the panels. I mentioned Whitebeard and Akainu having similar fruits because when both of these characters use them, there is a lot of splash damage. When Akainu launches magma from the sky, we see everyone, even his own team, running away in a panic. When Whitebeard uses his fruit, especially when he's attacking, like tilting the earth, we see that while a lot of his crew can predict his moves, even some people who are a part of his team but not aware of his abilities end up taking damage from this earthquake move. Even Aokiji is a little bit more careful, but we also see him have moments where his abilities will end up damaging his team. For example, when Akainu is uh, getting yelled at for creating a lot of trouble with his huge ice pillars that he makes in Marineford. We'll talk about individual character motivations in a second, but I want to talk about some of the highlights of the fights. 
Like how the warlords were terrible. Seriously, hiring pirates was a, was a bad idea. I think Kuma and Mihawk were the only warlords who didn't purposefully go after the marines. And at that point, you gotta just go like, all right, look, we tried this a few times. These pirates are bad, but they're not even that good when we pay them. So why do we pay them? Why are they on our side? If the warlords weren't in this fight besides Kuma and like maybe Mihawk, I think the marines would have had a way easier time. Doflamingo is just out there scheming. I don't understand what his intentions really are. He was trying to team up with Crocodile and he has a lot of like Joker vibes with the whole like justice is subjective ideology. So perhaps like with the auction house, he is only doing this, right? He's only in the war because it is a byproduct of what he actually wants, which seems to be the case for a lot of the other warlords. The war itself is a collision of what essentially equates to human weapons. If you don't have a devil fruit in this fight or have unnatural survivability, so if you're like a side character, then the war is just mayhem. We don't focus on this too much, but we see characters, if not dying, then at least taking point blank shots from Kuma and getting absolutely destroyed by Boa. And it's no better for the Marines. Like, it's fascinating to see that both sides over the course of this war are getting exceedingly more desperate from scheduling Ace's execution to be at a specific time to just straight up scrapping the idea and turning off the cameras. Even the pirates go from not overreacting to throw off any suspicion from the Marines to straight up just charging headforth towards Ace. Even Buggy manages to play a role here, even without directly contributing to most combat situations, simply by just keeping the broadcast on and showing the rest of the world what's happening in Marineford, even if most of what he's actually showing to the rest of the world is just the amazing Captain Buggy and not the actual war. I absolutely just love the ego that Buggy has throughout these past two arcs. Because when we cut to Saba Odi and have seen Captain Buggy just nonchalantly giving a dumb grin to the cameras, the medium of the story is depicting this as a humorous moment, when I can easily see it being depicted in a much more frightening context if the characters weren't purposefully depicted as goofballs. I could totally read this from the perspective of someone in Saba Odi who is witnessing the collapse of the world government as an insane pirate takes over the last remaining camera in Marineford. I mentioned the tendency for One Piece to be in serious situations but still have room for humor because when it switches back to something serious, you can feel it. And I think that can be seen most clearly when Whitebeard gets stabbed. Whitebeard has a lot of people who he cares about and vice versa, but it shouldn't be underestimated how much everyone fighting in Marineford is afraid of this war. The only people who aren't are like seen as insane. Most people avoided like the confrontation in Tabaoti where the stakes were high, but like nowhere near as high as this. And because the ramifications are huge here, especially from an outsider perspective who is seeing this entire war go down where like countless people could have died in exchange for one person potentially living. It's good to see some pirates being suspicious or afraid or at worst backstabbed if Whitebeard truly were to exchange all of these people from the new world just for one person. And it makes sense. Contextually, some of these people would be afraid. This is the biggest war of the era. Even Buggy was hesitant at first and still isn't too happy about getting into fights he doesn't want to be in. But we can see that him, along with other people in this war, are here because the reward outweighs the risk. For Whitebeard, it's getting back Ace. For Buggy, it's constantly shifting from one thing to another with whatever thing appeals more to his ego at that time. <laughs> And, and it's interesting to see Whitebeard knowing and feeding into that ego, along with everyone from Impel Down, like shifting Buggy's perspective to either help Ace or save Luffy or help Whitebeard. Buggy, Buggy's just great this arc. He plays a lot of roles here, and even just the absolutely dumb facial expressions he makes are golden. Okay, on another note, we didn't get a lot of exposition on this, and honestly, it's hard to dedicate a lot of time to these sections when there is so much happening in this war. But the connection between Eva and Kuma is fascinating to me. We got Kuma, probably the person who has listened to the world government more than any other warlord, used to be a revolutionary and so close with Eva. So why did Kuma choose to replace himself as a robot? 
right? Like Kuma in this regard is probably the most interesting character because it appears that he has like some kind of plan. Like he is playing the long con here, probably more than anybody else besides maybe like Blackbeard. Did Kuma save the Straw Hats because he's actually against the world government and Luffy has the potential to step up and do something about them? If we go one step further, did Kuma also do it knowing that nobody could really punish him anyways since he always planned on turning himself into a robot? Is this going to be a situation where Kuma would plan to revert back into human form with the help of someone like Frankie who is also practically a robot? Or maybe Kuma and Vegapunk planned something even bigger together. Because I don't believe that Kuma, who was previously a revolutionary and has done some like pretty gray area things against the world government's wishes, would just like willingly give up everything without a reason. From the looks of it, everyone has a pretty complex reason to fight in this war. Except for maybe Mihawk, who I think is just there to feel out the strength of everyone around here. Which is fine, I think it's in line with Mihawk. But what I didn't expect was a fight between Luffy and Mihawk. In the Luffy versus Mihawk fight, Luffy is seen to be more calculated than before. It's just interesting to see how Luffy strategizes. Like, he knows he's at a disadvantage and counters it in a different way. He also knows not to fight because he has bigger things to deal with. Like, Luffy might be reckless in his decision making, but he's pretty smart. He knows the consequences, and like everyone else in Marine Forward, the rewards outweigh the risk. Potentially saving Ace is worth potentially dying in Marineford. Boa herself managed to be on Luffy's side and definitely changed the course of the battle. Like, Boa this arc was stacked. She not only manages to protect Luffy from Smoker, but also, uh, as far as I can remember from what we actually got to see, is the only character there who was taking down Kuma like it was nothing. Which was such a contrasting moment from the events that happened in Sabaody. I'm pretty sure other people could have done it there too. We only got to see Boa, and she was great. She also gave Luffy the key, which couldn't be used at the end because, you know, things can't be that easy. But I don't think the Navy willingly gave all the warlords the key to Ace, meaning that she must have taken someone down to get it. And finally, in the list of warlords, we get Crocodile and Doflamingo. Moria is technically a warlord and whatever, but blah, 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 who cares? I already mentioned like a bit of Doflamingo's ideologies, along with him probably being there to see what goes down in history. But he doesn't actually help anyone as much as he tries to make his own progress in his own stuff. Even going so far as to ask Crocodile to join him. And Crocodile just straight up rejects Doflamingo's offer. It's interesting to see Crocodile having his own character development. Like, I think I underestimated Crocodile just as a character back in Alabasta. And here we see how he has gone from having an organization that values no one and everyone's being secretive to him teaming up with Mr. One and throughout this arc, saving Whitebeard, Ace, Luffy. Just not something I was expecting of him. I don't have the language to articulate these character dynamics, but the best way I can describe it is that these pirates have some level of respect for one another. Even if Crocodile wants to kill Whitebeard, he doesn't just want to see Whitebeard die or even get hurt, especially in the manner that he does. There is a level of respect and honor that needs to be maintained, and we see that throughout a lot of these characters. I have small brain. I can't explain what everyone's thinking, but you see it, right? There's, there's complexity here, and I think that's pretty cool. Which transitions us over into the main events. Whitebeard getting backstabbed, or should I say front stabbed, is tragic. It is absolutely tragic. I've already mentioned some of the mental states that many people must have had here. The paranoia and the utter gambling that everyone's doing just to save one person. We've already seen so many people, if not die, then at least take a lot of damage. And while this section is short, I love how this expands on that idea, and in turn how it allows us to see more character from Whitebeard and his crew. And how despite this act physically hurting him, as well as emotionally, because that's gotta suck, he still chooses to forgive and call all of these people his family. I find it funny how One Piece plays around with the trope of the world's strongest person, along with also being 
being the kindest person, which kind of leads us to the reason why Whitebeard went after Ace. Because it's one thing for him to call himself a father figure, but why? And immediately, I find it really interesting how Whitebeard's actions are dictated by his ideals of creating this found family structure from nothing. While pirates have gone out of their way to get treasure, whether it's Buggy going after a small time treasure or Gold Rogers creating like the biggest treasure of this era, it's very interesting to see Whitebeard purposefully choose the opposite path choosing to avoid direct fame and fortune and going for more of a sentimental value. Maybe the real treasure was the family we made along the way. But I love that we get to explore this concept. He essentially went out of his way to create an empire, this family of people who rely and care for him as they do for one another, from what I assume was practically nothing. He ended off with a collection of people who respected him as a father figure. The Great Pirate Era has resulted in a lot of children who have no father figures. We see that in Ace, in Luffy, in Usopp, and it's interesting that Whitebeard chose to fulfill that for a lot of people. Not even just individuals, but locations like Fishman Island. Choosing to help everyone who is a child of the sea. That's conceptually beautiful. Okay, um, side tangent. Before I even get into this whole uh, Ace thing, I need to talk about Ace being Gold Roger's son. Because look, while for you it could have been like a small plot twist or just something that you already predicted, I had been thrown into the absolute deep end here, all right? Back in my Drum Island review, I theorized that Luffy might have been Gold Roger's son because at the time, those two characters were the only two characters who had the D initial. Someone in the comments was very quick to point out that if you do the math, which I did not do because I'm very bad at math, then you can tell that Luffy would have been born a few years after Gold Rogers was executed. So it would have been impossible for Gold Rogers to be Luffy's father. And I was like, okay, wow, that's a really convincing argument. You got me. All right, Luffy can't be Gold Roger's son. And then fast forward to Alabasta. We now get confirmation that Ace is Luffy's brother. Very interesting. Someone again points out the comment that Luffy cannot be Gold Roger's son. And at this point, I'm convinced. I'm like, nah, you're right. It would be too cheesy if the main protagonist was the son of this character who created this entire era of piracy. It would be like too cheesy and a little bit fan fiction-y if that were the case. Cut to post Ennis Lobby where I learned that Dragon is Luffy's father. And I'm like, yeah, okay, nope. Now it definitely checks out. It confirms the event in Logtown. It confirms Luffy and Ace's parents. Luffy has told Eva and Eva was like, yep, that checks out. The math is correct. And at this point, I have been guided very hard in this direction. And finally, we reach Impel Down where I talk about Ace being Dragon's son and how that caused a lot of buildup issues for Ace with Ace not even mentioning Dragon by his own name. And someone out there in the comments was like, wow, I never thought about it that way. Good job. And you know what? I felt so smart. And now look at me. I've been played for a fool. But seriously, though, I love all of the, like, mixed messages, these, like, fake spoilers and stuff. And it's just been really interesting how I've been guided the wrong way here, thanks to all of the comments. Which, honestly, has made this a way funner experience. Okay, so it's really interesting to me that up until these last few arcs, Ace has been a character that we've probably devoted the least amount of time to. Like, we've known what he's doing and we know where he's going, but we hardly had any time devoted to Ace from his own perspective. And so, from a writing perspective, a lot of this character development is happening through the perspective of everyone around him. We learn about Ace through Whitebeard and Jimbei and Luffy and Garp. And while there are a lot of big intense things that happen throughout this saga, it's the less intense, the more introspective sections that made me empathize with Ace. Not only do we see Ace's entire worth being tied to someone who Ace doesn't even know, but also how that builds upon his fears and doubts that he carries throughout the rest of his life. And how we see him go from this person who values his own self-worth in relation to Rogers to eventually growing up and valuing himself in opposition to Rogers before finally being accepted by Whitebeard and rejecting any connection to Rogers. Beautifully tying together Whitebeard's story 
with aces. This whole saga is revolving around a person who was conflicted by his own self-worth, being fought for and saved, surrounded by people who care for him. Even Garp is there for him, which honestly, kind of hurts the most. Because unlike a lot of the other scenes that rely on trying to go after Ace and like boldly making a claim against the world, a lot of the moments between Garp and Ace are a lot more subtle and quiet. From their small talk reminiscing in Impel Down to him sitting down with Ace at the podium, Garp, out of everyone here, is in a truly tough position. He has to juggle being both a marine and a father figure. And I say all of that because I did not expect Garp to fight. Throughout a lot of this war, Garp has been a passive observer watching Whitebeard and Luffy struggle to get to the top, getting just annihilated every step of the way. So I didn't expect them to do anything when Luffy was climbing up, but Garp steps up to the podium. Luffy had to do a lot to get here. Even when someone like Kobe tried to stop him, Luffy had to force himself to push on forward. But here, I was really wondering what he was going to do. We see Luffy at first ask Garp just to simply move, and well, Garp doesn't do that, and then clearly whiffs his punch to let Luffy through. I think that moment shows us a lot about Garp. This character who seemingly had no problem stopping Luffy just folded. It reminds me of like Aokiji in that regard with Robin. Luffy here has been pushed through his limits, he has been to hell and back, and at this point, I think has absolutely proved himself as someone who can sit at the big boy table, at least when it comes to his willpower. In the broader aspects of the war, it's clear that just things have gotten absolutely desperate, from lifting up the barriers to Whitebeard responding by pushing through with the Moby Dick. I don't remember if this one had a name or not, but I like that even in this war, there is still a tragedy when a ship falls. When the Moby Dick is seen burning down, there is an isolated frame where you can feel that Whitebeard really cared about the Moby Dick, the same way that the Straw Hats cared about the Going Merry. And I haven't really mentioned this, but I like that there is this relation between the crew and the ship. We see pirates have dedicated ships, but we haven't really seen marines have dedicated ships outside of maybe like Garps' dog ship. All right, let's talk about Whitebeard. Um, at this point, Whitebeard has just taken a beating. Uh, Whitebeard has just been completely obliterated, right? Even with all of his weaknesses, with like the lack of medication, with his oldening age, with, with everything. Whitebeard was truly an absolute tank in this war. As a side tangent, I want to talk about One Piece, who, at this point, what even is it? Nobody knows, and nobody really knows if it's real or not. It is something that started this era, but something that we've seen fall back into obscurity and get kind of, like, doubted upon back in Mocktown. And while Roger's execution created this era, the world government winning could have quickly stomped out this era. In part, Ace's execution was just that. Claiming Ace as Roger's son to the world was attempting to show that the light had been stomped out. And in turn, I think Whitebeard reaffirming the One Piece's legitimacy is designed to instead relight this into a new pirate era, despite of what happens in Marineford. But seriously though, like what a, what a champion that guy. Like even when he's dying, he stands tall. And I love that the final order he made was just for everyone to return back home safely. Not to win this war. When Luffy got back Ace, that's all everyone wanted. Now you just gotta get out of there. It is so poetically resonant how this man left at the peak. He ended that era. Equally poetic is how his ship is gone. He has nowhere else to go. It's really profound to see this father figure go out of his way to save his kid in hopes of letting that kid see a future of an era that Whitebeard himself cannot witness. I've talked about how we were able to see Ace's complexity through the limited screen time that he's had. And we've also been able to see a lot of his flaws. That's not a bad thing. In this case, I think it makes it even more tragic that he was practically there. Ace was almost free, in the finish line, nearly done, and he walks it back. Akainu knew this ego, and pretty smartly on his part, was able to insult and belittle Whitebeard in hopes of getting Ace to face him, even when everyone else told him otherwise. 
It's absolutely tragic that Ace took the bait. Even Luffy isn't safe from this. And honestly, it's just surprising that he got out. Um, <laughs> well, not unscathed. Half scathed? Look, Luffy has not had a good saga. The admirals were like, oh, guess luck was on his side. That guy does not look lucky. And I was already kind of in the dumps, right? It was a bad time. So my last thought was, what is Blackbeard doing here? I mean, I knew it would happen. Like, I've been talking about this part for a while, even if I got, like, a lot of other things wrong. Let's not focus on those parts. <laughs> but I definitely misunderstood why. We've learned that Blackbeard has essentially been playing 4D chess this entire time. He saved up reputation on Whitebeard's ship and wasted it to kill a guy. He saved his reputation to become a warlord and wasted that in Impel Down. So why? Because Blackbeard is playing the longest game of 4D chess. He's not even planning out for the next arc or two. It's not even a plan with anything to do within this era but he's planning to do something for the next era. In hindsight, he was he was not going to take down Whitebeard by himself. But with Whitebeard taken down, he somehow managed to get another devil fruit, which um yeah, I I don't I don't know how he did that. <laughs> We could chalk it up to like his devil fruit absorbing the other devil fruit because it's like a black hole fruit. But I like to think that maybe no one has tried eating two before. We've never seen it happen. It's just like a rumor. So what if it just didn't kill you and everyone just thinks it does? Huh? Oh, what, do you, what do you think about that theory? <laughs> Okay, at the beginning of the arc, I was wondering whether or not any of the other rookies were going to play into this at all. Because it's a world-changing event, and some of the rookies were like, Heh -heh, better move out halfway through the arc instead of just watching it go down. But I don't know what's weirder, the fact that nobody showed up, or that only Law showed up, and despite being rivals, still chose to save Luffy. Maybe it's because he saw what Luffy's potential was and had plans for that. I don't really know where I'm going with this one, I'll be honest. Anyways, it's fascinating to see him coming in and saving Luffy from this pretty dangerous circumstance. Like, Luffy's not doing so hot. He's practically on life support. Um, anyways, um, Law, I think it's pretty neat that you showed up when no one else did. Uh, you get a good job sticker. Psh. Okay, so on a completely unrelated note, I think Akainu is the only one that we've seen just bring out raw, toxic, revenge-like justice. The closest we've gotten to that is Magellan and Hannibal back in Impel Down, specifically to uphold some ideal of justice, but here, it is ravenous. It is that type of like self-aggrandizing justice that we've rarely seen any other Navy personnel do, with only Kobe being the one to step up and try to stop it. Which is just fascinating character development, because I think for as little as we see in Kobe, it's amazing to see continuous character development through these small amounts of screen time that we've seen of him. He's a character that has grown to have a pretty strong spirit, like enough to persuade, or at least try to persuade, Akainu to stop. Because Akainu is just insane. That guy is <laughs> a little hot-headed. Finally, we gotta end it with Shanks, just like how Shanks ended that war. Um, that was a bad transition. I think Shanks here thematically plays a role by contrasting him to Luffy and showcasing how far just Luffy has to go. Like Shanks specifically chooses not to meet with Luffy at this moment because Luffy at this time is not capable yet. It's probably a good idea that he didn't because Luffy is practically a guy dying in the backseat of an ambulance. But with Shanks being there and Sengoku being like, yeah, no, nah, you're right. We should stop the war. You passed the vibe check. This war luckily just didn't down spiral into just utter chaos. I'm just surprised that Shanks gets to keep Ace and Whitebeard for the burial. Like, I get that the world government would have wanted them around and everything, but at this point, I think it's better for Shanks to just do the burial and get that respectable ending post-death. You know, I kept seeing this everywhere on Twitter, and I didn't understand it, so I was like, you know what? I'm just going to wait until I find out what this is, and then I'll talk about it. And you know what? Now that I finished reading Marineford, I, I still don't know what this is. Like, what can you even add to this? I liked all the variants of this meme, except for that one variant that we know what that variant is, and we're not going to talk about it. 
<laughs> um, anyways, thanks for the people who are still somehow supporting me on Patreon. 